I'd like to start with a question. What kind of relationship do we want to have with intelligent technology? To explore that, let me take you back 10 years to the story of a little robot that wanted to hitchhike across Canada. It wanted to get to know what people are like and just have a good time with them. So that robot's name was Hitchbot. It began its journey in Halifax in Nova Scotia on the east coast of Canada. Now, Hitchbot couldn't walk or roll. All it could do was hold up its thumb and say that it wanted to hitchhike to Victoria on the west coast. And the people of Canada said, yeah. And they gave it rides. They took it camping, to a wedding, to their homes, to bars. And they told its story online and the media followed along. And when it finally arrived in Victoria, there was a big party waiting. So the robot had been created by our team back then, professors and students from McMaster University and Toronto Metropolitan University in Canada. And not to test technology, but to test us. See, the question we were asking wasn't the usual one, can humans trust robots? We were asking the opposite. Can robots trust humans? And back then, the answer was yes. And we learned a lot. We learned that people don't need to be told what to do with technology. They figured it out in their own creative ways. And technology doesn't have to be perfect to be meaningful. Hitchbot had many flaws, but it was authentic in its own way. Trust begins with authenticity. Hitchbot had no utility, but it had personality. And the magic happens when we use more than one channel of interaction. So Hitchbot existed on the roadside, yeah, but also online and in people's stories, in their photos, in their hearts. And bringing together humans and technology with a little bit of imagination, creativity can happen. So. Meaningful technology, humans, connection, creativity, and trust. This really sums up what we learned from Hitchbot. But what do we experience today? What has changed since Hitchbot? I'd say a lot. In the past 10 years, AI has gone from an abstract concept to an everyday tool. We have it everywhere, in our phones, in our homes, in classrooms, at workplaces. And it helps us write, draw, make music, navigate, sometimes even to think. So what kind of relationship are we building with technology? To answer that, I'm using the framework that I call dialectical intelligence. Now, don't worry, this is not a philosophy lecture. They didn't want to let me do that here. But dialectics, of course, goes way back to Socrates, um, Hegel, and lots of philosophers. And dialectics is the idea of holding opposites in tension. So we have on one side, thesis. On the other side, we have antithesis. And they clash together, basically. And then we create synthesis out of the friction. Let me try that, that way. So let's think of a ping pong ball in a game of table tennis. And the ball goes back and forth from one player to the other. And each time the ball hits the player's record, it transforms a little bit. So at the end of the game, we have a transformed ball in a new shape, a new form, or a whole new idea of what a ball is. And that's when we create synthesis out of thesis and antithesis. So this is the space where dialectical intelligence lives, not in choosing sides, but in creating a new kind of understanding. Yeah, what happens if we apply this to humans and AI? We can say humans, they are defined by emotion, lived experience and creativity. Yeah, that's the thesis. AI, can be defined by speed, scale, th synthetic output. 
that's antithesis. And then collaboration, co-creation, building something new, that's synthesis. So to build synthesis, however, we need to understand the ingredients of both sides. And that begins with a big question. So what kind of knowledge does AI actually produce? Or how do we know if and what AI knows? Knowledge is, of course, central to AI, but knowledge just doesn't come from lots of data, right? It derives from lived experience. So what is lived experience for an AI system? Is that even possible? To a certain extent, yes. Um, Gen AI or AI, of course, is not conscious, but it does mimic aspects of human learning. It gathers huge amounts of data, of information. It connects patterns and arrives at its own internal logic. And just as we humans do the same, we learn from each other and we make sense of the world around us. So we make sense through emotion, memory, and sensation, through time and space that we feel. For example, we have been waiting for 50 minutes for a friend and that friend is late and we are frustrated. Suddenly the friend comes in and says, I have sprinted, I'm barely late. Same clock, different experience. Now AI doesn't have that. It doesn't feel time, space, or even frustration. It just calculates and mimics. And this matters because if AI is trained on biased or incorrect data, it will show in its outcomes. As the philosopher Hegel said, the tools for our understanding of the world shape what we think is true. So if the tools are flawed, so is our understanding of the truth. So let's focus more on creativity. Margaret Bowden, a pioneer in computer science and cognition, says that human creativity and intelligence go hand in hand. And it's not just novelty, it's the surprise of something new, a new idea of something that's of use, of value. And of course, an AI system can do the same. But how does creativity happen in an AI system? Is it in how we use it? There's a few questions we need to ask. So first of all, is AI a tool or something more? Can it be creative? or only through us guiding it? Do we shape the output, or is it starting to shape us? And are we partners with AI, or is just users? Often in mainstream media, they are asking very similar questions, but they usually or very often they substitute AI with robots. This is, of course, because AI is hard to visualize, really hard to describe, right? So robots often represent AI. So let's talk about robots and AI together. Going back to our hitchhiker story. What has changed in the last 10 years regarding our relationship to AI and robots? I think we have become much closer to being able to create artificial objects that mimic and make use of our behaviors in a much better way. Large language models, for example, have improved speech recognition immensely. And as sociologist Cherry Turco says, we have now a new generation of digital creatures that are much better at understanding us and working with us. But are those creatures really able to understand us? That's a big question. And as we meet more AI systems in robotic forms or otherwise, we often compare our relationship with them to our relationships with other people, right? But is that the right comparison? As Turkel says, ultimately, we shouldn't ask the question whether our children will be loving their robotic pets more than their animal pets. But rather, what will love become to mean? So this simple sentence really describes 
what could happen to us. And I keep thinking about it, and I think we all should think about it. As we get more and more immersed with intelligent technologies, we need to ask ourselves, um, will technology continue to adapt to us, or will we start adapting to it? And so far, I would say, in, according to critical the studies of technology, it often happens that technology adapts to us, and so it should, to our needs. For example, the mobile phone, right? So its original plans didn't really include the option of texting. But then suddenly lots of keyboards came popping up. This is a good example for us how we have adapted technology to our needs. But it's also true the other way around. We often tussle with technology, right? Um, because it just doesn't do what we want it to do. And still, we keep using it. For example, desktop PCs and their operating systems. We buckle and use it and are frustrated very often. Why do we do that? Is it because we have to use it in our workplace? Is it because we don't know how to change it? Or what alternative there is? But with AI, something else is happening. It has its own kind of rhythm. It has its own internal form of knowledge and creativity. And yet, at the same time, it mimics human intelligence and comes in different forms. As a robot, as an intelligent voice assistant, as a smart fridge. These days, we seem to be able to turn everything into intelligent objects. But often, when we talk about it, it's still going back to the old master and slave dialectics. I think many of us have heard about the battle of master and slave when it comes to robotic development. Our nightmare is that one day we develop something that will turn us into slaves instead of us letting just be the happy masters. So I wonder. Will we talk like Siri and Alexa one day? Will we change our questions to the machines? And up to what degree will we change just to be able to use intelligent machines that make our lives so much easier? I think it is time actually to stop thinking in those dichotomies that ultimately are only concerned about power and control. I think we can do better than just coming up with two concepts, master or slave, winner or loser, important or not important. But don't worry, I'm not one of those optimists who only sees the good in all people always. But as a researcher, actually, it sometimes really makes sense to start asking the important questions a little bit in a different way, to turn them upside down, back to front, and then to juxtapose them with something entirely different just as we did with Hitchbot. Remember, we didn't ask, can humans trust robots? We asked, can robots trust humans? Now, what happens, or what would happen if we ask, can AI trust humans, instead of can humans trust AI? Could we come up with an experiment similar to Hitchbot, where we you know, let the people participate, not just the researchers. And we, it's up to them, first of all, if they want to engage with AI or not, and then what they want to do with it. Do they want to have fun with it? Do they want to work with it, be creative? Or do they just want to kill it? Because you see, Hitchbot, on its last trip in the US in 2015, was killed. <laughs> yes. And um, I think... We have to have more of these open participatory projects that are full of creativity and instill creativity. So here we are again, talking of creativity. Can creativity help us navigate life with AI? I think it can and it must. But um, a creative human AI synthesis should not just be up to those that are privileged and powerful. I think it has to open up and it has to include everyone just like Hitchbot did with its sum up and asking for people's help and creativity and imagination. So the future of intelligent technology should not be a closed circuit. 
it should be an invitation to all of us to participate, to shape, and to create. Because ultimately, what we build together with machines will not just show our intelligence. It will reveal our values. Thank you.